All right, so we are looking at transport across the cell membrane or cellular transport. There are two ways through which things are able to pass through the cell membrane. The first method is via passive transport. Passive transport is also known as diffusion. The second method through which things are able to cross from the outside of the cell to the inside of the cell, passing through the cell membrane, is through active transport. When you are talking about active transport, you basically use energy in form of ATP. So meaning that you are moving molecules from a region of low concentration to a region of high concentration. Passive transport, you don't use any energy. You are moving molecules from a region of high concentration to a region of low concentration. So because it is flowing down a concentration gradient, there is no need for energy. So passive transport, as we have just said, is a movement along the concentration gradient or down the concentration gradient from a region of high concentration to the region of low concentration. No energy is required. It's more like swimming in the direction of water in a river. Okay, that is passive transport. It's also known as diffusion. So there are some factors that affect the rate of diffusion. For example, the cross-sectional area across which diffusion is taking place. Let's say the cell membrane is very thick. So the thicker the cell membrane, the slower the rate of diffusion. And then another thing that we can talk about is concentration gradient. The bigger the concentration gradient, let's say on one end of the cell I've got 20 molecules, the other end you only have two molecules. And then for another instance, on one end of the cell I've got 10 molecules, the other side you have got five. The second one I've talked about there is a small concentration gradient because the difference in ion concentration on the two ends of the cell membrane is small. While the other one, the first one, the concentration gradient is big. So fixed law gives us a relationship that describes how fast a particle is going to be moving in relation to concentration gradient and the cross-sectional area. The rate, which you can see here as j, the rate is going to be equal to the area multiplied by the change in concentration divided by the thickness. Now, this area we are talking about is more like a door. Think of it, you have got five people that wants to pass through a door. So passing through a door of a house and a door of, let's say, a very big hole where the door is very big. Where do you think there's going to be fast passing? So obviously expect where the door is very big that people will be able to pass so faster because there is a big area through which people can pass. So area, the bigger the, 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 bigger the area, the faster the rate of diffusion. The bigger the, the concentration gradient, the faster the rate of diffusion. But for thickness, it's opposite. The thicker, because you can see in the denominator, the thicker the, uh, the membrane through which you are passing a molecule, the slower the rate of diffusion. So thickness is opposite. So passive transport, also known as diffusion, is of two types. You can have simple diffusion or facilitated diffusion. Simple diffusion is where molecules are just passing the cell membrane themselves like that. Facilitated diffusion, of course, molecules are moving from a region of high concentration to a region of low concentration, but there is something that is helping them. We call them carriers. So there is something that is carrying this molecule from one end of the cell 
to the other end of the cell. That is what we mean by carrier. Please, if you have got any question at any point, be free to open your mic and ask. Okay? Ask. You'll find these things in your test one. Mm -hmm. Okay, so someone is asking about the thickness. So you can see this this cell membrane. If it is now, I'm talking about generally when you're talking about the movement of particles via a selective repairable membrane. If that membrane is very thick, the rate of diffusion is going to be small or slow. If it is thin, it's going to be faster, depending with what the membrane is. Simple diffusion, as we are saying, it can be, uh, I mean, diffusion or passive transport can either be simple or facilitated. Simple is where molecules are just moving by themselves. Facilitated is something that is carrying them. Now, simple diffusion can happen through a lipid layer or the protein layer because the cell membrane has got a lipid component, a protein component, and the carbohydrate component. So things can actually pass through the lipid itself without assistance of anything. Or they can pass through proteins in the cell membrane. Starting the diffusion passing through the lipid layer. If you are passing through the lipid, the only molecule that can pass through the lipid layer are those molecules which are also lipids or hydrophilic, okay? No, not really hydrophilic, but hydrophobic. They don't love water. So something that does not love water is going to love lipids. So we call it as a lipophilic. It loves lipids, okay? So for molecules to be able to pass through the lipid layer by simple diffusion, they should be able to dissolve through lipids or they should be able to dissolve in lipids and examples of that includes oxygen carbon dioxide and alcohol these molecules oxygen and carbon dioxide they will just cross the cell membrane without assistance by anything while molecules that cross the cell membrane through the protein layer have to be hydrophilic meaning they love water so these things are mostly going to be electrolytes ions like sodium chlorine potassium those are going to be able to pass through the protein layer why because they can't pass through the lipid layer and what's the reason because they love water and the lipid will repel anything that loves water okay and then but how are those proteins which pass through the protein going to be able to pass? They use what we call channels, also known as ion channels or protein channels. Now, protein channels are actually integral proteins. So we have got two types of proteins which are found in the cell membrane. Integral proteins and also peripheral proteins. Peripheral proteins are proteins which are found at the end of the cell membrane. Integral proteins are also known as transmembrane proteins. They pass through the cell membrane from one end of the cell membrane to the other end. So they will start, let's say this is the outside of the cell. This is the inside of the cell. They'll be able to pass through. So it is through these channels that ions will be able to pass through. But remember, this is passive transport, meaning that energy is not required. Okay. So, some of these channels will only open when something happens. Others are always open. So, meaning that things can always pass through, ions can always pass through anytime. So, those channels which are always open, we call them and gated channels because they are always open those which are closed which can only opened by some things are called gated channels 
Some of them, they can only be opened when there is a change in voltage. Others can only be opened when there is a ligand binding. For a ligand, these are just hormones. Let's say an hormone binds to this channel, then it will be able to open. Others are mechanically gated, meaning that they only open when there is a mechanical stimuli. For example, if I touch you, you can feel that I've touched you because that is mechanical. What happens is that when I touch you, these channels are going to be opened and then sodium will be able to pass through and that makes the nerves to be able to pick up the signal and then I can feel that someone has touched me. Now, that was simple diffusion. Remember we've said that passive diffusion can either be simple diffusion or facilitated diffusion. Facilitated diffusion, this is where there is actually something that is helping to carry. It's different from simple diffusion. Simple diffusion is you only have these gates, right? These are gates. And then molecules are passing through from one end of the cell to the other end of the cell. But facilitated diffusion, you have got gates, but then something has to be carried to bind on one side and then it will be thrown into to the other side. That is what we call a carrier mediated diffusion or facilitated diffusion. Some things which are transported by this method is glucose and amino acids. So there will be less if you eat food that contains uh, glucose. Your, uh, your nutrients are in the intestines. What will happen is that the glucose is going to be removed from the lumen or the space in the intestines and taken into the cells by carriers. We call them glucose transporters. So there are different factors that affect the rate of diffusion, including permeability of the cell membrane. If the cell membrane is more permeable, it will allow things to be able to pass through very much. If temperature is high, then things will be able to pass through very much. Concentration gradient also. But when it comes to concentration gradient, you need to differentiate between rate of diffusion for simple diffusion and for facilitated diffusion. So for simple diffusion, when the concentration gradient is big, the rate of the reaction will also be big. But for facilitated diffusion, is going to be different. I'm going to talk about it on the next slide. Substances which are more soluble to the cell membrane will be able to pass through faster. That is why oxygen and carbon dioxide passes through the cell membrane faster. And then substances which are small can actually pass through the cell membrane faster than those which are big because they are going to be stopped. So this graph is describing the rate of diffusion when you are talking about simple diffusion and facilitated diffusion. Simple diffusion, when you increase the concentration of the substrate or the substance, the rate will be increasing. So the more the compounds, the faster the rate. But facilitated diffusion is different because you need a carrier. Think of it. You need the young for it to move from Ridgeway to main campus. So when you get to increase the number of people, it will not increase how many people will be at main campus from Ridgeway. Why? Because it depends on the number of youngos to take them there. If you don't have enough youngos, then people will be here. They will not be at main campus. So facilitated diffusion, when you increase the concentration of the substance to be transported, the rate of the reaction is going to increase. But then there will be a point when, when you have increased the substances very much, there will no longer be any carrier to transport those substances. So even when you increase the concentration, there is nothing to transport them. So that's why you can see the rate is not changing. That is for facilitated diffusion. Okay, that is important. And then active transport. Now active transport is transporting things using energy. The, now energy is in the form of ATP. So what happens is that when ATP is broken down, because ATP means adenosine triphosphate, you have got three phosphates. If you remove one phosphate, it will remain diphosphate. That bond that holds one phosphate to the ADP is high energy. So when you break that bond, the reaction is going to release energy and that energy is going to be used to transport substances. Okay, 
Now, when it comes to this kind of transport, you can move different compounds at the same time. So, you can move one compound from one end of the cell to the, and, uh, to the other end of the cell. That is known as uniport because you only transported one compound. You can as well move two different substances, but one is moving forward while the other one is moving behind. They are moving in opposite direction. That is called antiport, also known as the counter transport. Or you can move both molecules to the same in the same direction. And when you're moving molecules in the same direction, that is known as the symport, also known as the core transport. You are moving in the same direction. So we need to understand the types of active transport. Remember, active transport is you are basically using energy. We have got primary active transport and secondary active transport. Primary active transport is where you are transporting a compound and in this reaction, energy is going to be released direct from the breakdown of ATP. Okay. For example, you have got what we call the sodium potassium pump. By now, you should be able to know that sodium is more outside the cell. Potassium is more inside the cell. How do I know? P's are more mostly inside the cell. Potassium, phosphate, proteins, P's are more inside the cell. Sodium is more outside the cell. So the sodium potassium ATPs is a primary active transporter. What this one does is that it will be transporting sodium. Remember, sodium is more where? Outside the cell. So any sodium that is inside the cell, you are trying to remove it to take it outside the cell. Potassium is supposed to be more inside the cell. So any so potassium that is outside the cell, you are taking it inside. But take note that you get three sodium, you take it outside, and then three, uh, two potassium, you take it inside. That is what happens. That is the sodium ATPs. That is how you transport. This is known as the sodium potassium ATPs. So you can transport three sodium out of the cell and then two potassium inside the cell. You can see you actually require ATP, you require energy. The other thing that you can be able to transport. Okay, before I, I move out of the sodium potassium ATPs, we have got what we call cardiac glycosides because you guys are in health sciences, so you need to be learning medical applications on each topic. Okay. So cardiac glycosides are medicines that can inhibit they can stop the sodium potassium pump. So meaning that the sodium will not be pumped outside the cell, the potassium will not be pumped inside the cell. Okay. So that is what these medicines do. They just inhibit this pump. The transporting of calcium also is active transport, meaning that you need energy to be able to transport calcium. Now, calcium is a very important ion. For our muscles to contract, we need calcium. For us to feel pain, that nerve impulse that has to be carried, we need calcium. So it's a very important ion. Okay. For us to also transport hydrogen, you know of hydrochloric acid, right? Hydrochloric acid is the acid that is produced by our stomach. But for to produce that acid, you need actually to move hydrogen from the cells to the lumen of the intestine, to the lumen of the stomach. Lumen is that space where food is going to be. So you need an hydrogen transporter, which is a primary transporter. They can actually give you a question to say which of the following is a primary, a primary active transporter. Okay. Which of the following molecules can be transported by primary active transport? Also in the kidney, hydrogen, when you have got too much carbon dioxide, what happens is that carbon dioxide will react with water. You form what we call carbonic acid. And then carbonic acid can break down into hydrogen ion and bicarbonate. 
that hydrogen ion can then be removed from the body in the kidney in uh, through the cells we call the alpha intercalated cells these are found in the distal convoluted tubules if you can remember in high school so there is a medicine which is known as omeprazole omeprazole can inhibit or it can stop this pump the hydrogen pump for people who have got ulcers you know of ulcers immediately they eat something that has got gases they start to their stomach is paining very much so for people with ulcers you can actually give them omeprazole because omeprazole will stop the production of hydrochloric acid because it stops the movement of hydrogen that is omeprazole that is primary active transport you are using energy directly all right you are utilizing energy directly now for secondary active transport what happens in secondary active transport is you are transporting one molecule but then as you are transporting that molecule using energy you utilize it to transport another molecule take note of that for example i get a yango i want to go to main campus i pay for that yango but then someone else sees okay i've already paid for the yango they don't have money they say okay using the yango which mwansa has already paid for let me also get in so that i can also go to main campus so i am the one who paid money but then the other person has gained an advantage because of the money that i already paid so in secondary active transport what happens is that sodium is going to be transported using energy so that energy that you are using to transport sodium another molecule utilize it to transport to, to transport it uh, going in the other direction or in the same direction so that is what happens using so second active transport so energy is not used directly but it is used indirectly please take note that is very very important do we have any question are we okay Are we good? Oh, I know I, I get you. I get you. But don't worry. You you still have access to the class. But from here, just make sure that you continue because what I'm talking about in what I'm about to talk about in front is not related to the previous and we've just done a little okay so second active transport remember you are transporting one compound right y using energy the energy that you are using using that compound another compound utilizes it to move so it can either be a simport or antport simport means that you are transporting two molecules in the same direction antport you are transporting two molecules in opposite directions okay for example examples of simports you can transport glucose and sodium so you are going to be utilizing the energy for sodium to transport glucose and this will happen in the kidney do you know that if you find glucose in your urine it means that you have got a kidney problem so you can actually measure the concentration of glucose in the urine Okay, you can measure the concentration of glucose in the urine and that will tell you if someone has got a kidney problem or not. Okay. Okay, K, uh, if your video is on, please uh, switch it off so that people will not be able to, to concentrate on two ends. 
Another thing that can be transported using a cold transport or a simport is amino acids. So you are transporting sodium, you are also transporting amino acids at the same time. This can also happen in the kidney. In the same kidney, you can also be transporting sodium, at the same time you are transporting potassium and chlorine. You are going to understand this very much when we talk about renal physiology. Very, very important and it's high yield. Okay, so these are the three most important things that can be transported by co transport, which is a secondary active transport. And then you have got counter transport. Counter transport means that when you are transporting one molecule in the forward direction, another molecule is being transported in the backward direction. For example, you can transport calcium in the opposite direction to sodium or you can transport hydrogen in the opposite direction to, to sodium. Remember the many molecules is sodium because we are utilizing the energy that we are using to transport sodium to transport another molecule. The calcium sodium pump or exchange is present in the muscle because for muscles to contract we need calcium. The sodium hydrogen exchangers are present in the kidneys. If you have got too much acid, the kidneys can actually remove some excess acid using this pump. There are also some other special types of active transport. We call them vesicular transport. We have got endocytosis, exocytosis, and transcytosis. Now, endocytosis is you are taking something that is outside the cell to the inside of the cell. That is endocytosis. Something is outside the cell, you drink it, it goes inside the cell. I'm not saying drinking using your mouth. The cell takes it and it goes inside. So endocytosis can be of three types. You have got pinocytosis, phagocytosis, and receptor-mediated endocytosis, which is also known as clathrin-mediated endocytosis. So starting with pinocytosis, Pinocytosis is cell drinking. You are drinking something. Look at what is happening here. This is the inside of the cell that you can see in blue. This is the outside of the cell. So molecules are going to go, okay? They are going to be on the cell membrane. And then the cell membrane invaginates. To invaginate, if you've learned the first topic in anatomy, is to go inside. So the cell membrane invaginates. And then later on, it will be able to close on top here. So you end up, those things have been trapped and they are now in a vesicle. That is endo, uh, this is a pinocytosis. And then you have got phagocytosis. Phagocytosis is known as cell eating. Pinocytosis is cell drinking. So look at what happens. This is the molecule that was on the cell membrane. The cell membrane first went up like that and then it grabbed more like that particle. And then now it was also taken into the cell by invagination. But one important thing is that there is a pseudopodia here. Pseudopodia is like the cell membrane is forming arms or hands around the molecule that has to be taken to the inside of the cell. When this molecule is taken to the inside of the cell, then it can be destroyed. Okay, that is it. Uh, phagocytosis. Receptor mediated endocytosis, also known as clathrin mediated endocytosis. The molecule, the, the, uh, the molecules that have to be taken to the inside of the cell are going to bind to some receptors. A receptor is just a part of the cell membrane that receives the things. So these molecules will be able to bind on the receptors and then now there's going to be an invagination. But the most important thing is that there's first a receptor and then there's going to be invagination. Okay. Those receptors where these molecules are binding to is known as clathrin. That is why we call this as clathrin mediated endocytosis. Do we have any question up to here? Any question? Okay. Okay. Uh, a receptor is a molecule that is found 
on the surface of the cell membrane. So what happens is that if any molecule wants to pass through or molecules come in contact with these things, they will be held. Let's say, for example, these molecules are actually toxic. They are going to be held by a receptor. And then a signal will be sent to the inside of the cell that we have got something here. So when that signal is sent, and then it will be like, okay, you've, you've got something, bring it inside to be now taken inside to be destroyed. Okay, those are receptors. Is that okay? Okay. We also have what we call exocytosis. Exocytosis is the opposite of endocytosis. Something was inside the cell, but then you are removing it. And one important thing is that exocytosis requires calcium. For you to remove things which are inside the cell and bring them outside, you need calcium. Very important. Okay. That is it on transport across the cell membrane. I always put questions at the end of my session so that you just know what you are expected to be able to answer. You can get to try out this. This question was a true or false question. Endocytosis, you have got A, B, C, and D. So you can get to try out. For each option, you need to put whether it's true or it's false. For A, put whether it's true or false. For B, just like that. Also, this one regarding transport across the cell membrane, show the following is not correct. You can as well get to try it out. And then also, according to fixed law of diffusion, particle flux would decrease if there is an increase in the movement of water between the intracellular and the extracellular compartment is regulated by. You can as well look at this question here. We talked about the transport there. Can as well look at this one. Okay, so that is it. Now you you won't be able to access the notes because the notes are on a drive. They are on Google Drive, and the videos will be posted on Google Drive, and only those who are registered can access the drive. But I'll, I'll make this class free. I'll post it on Facebook, but the notes you can't access them. Ah, uh, sorry, I'll post it on on YouTube so that you can get to follow it in case you, you want to revise somewhere. You can as well look at the questions at the end. But in case you want the notes, only those who have got access to the drive, those who have registered.